Hello everyone, today is Thursday, March 28, 2019. This is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for coming today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to be here. Thank you so much. All right, what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, and there's a lot of developing things that I think are important. Also, I do want to touch upon the inverted yield curve. Nothing earth-shattering there, but some ways that I see it. I almost see it like any other news event or something that everybody's going crazy over. But we'll get to that. Your favorite stock picks, if you don't mind, wait till we get the live charts for that. And I'll let you know when that is. And you'll notice the charts have turned to live. <laughs> but uh, for your benefit, if you don't mind, just ask about one stock at a time. You can ask about as many as you want. Just to ask one at a time. We've got a small group here today, so we should be able to get them all in. Today, I want to talk about control, and then probably more accurately, control or lack thereof. Before we do that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or I'll have to sum it up. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I thank my buddy Greg Morris for giving me that. I woke up this morning thinking about what I'm going to talk about today. And then I got to thinking about repeatability. And that made me think about a lot of these get rich gurus out there, these get rich quick gurus. There's a new batch of them that's starting to piss me off. And. I don't know why I'm letting them get to me. And I think it's because what they're doing is disingenuous. And it's I think that's what's really aggravating me. And if you dig into some of these guys, and I probably dug into them a little bit too much. In other words, I probably wasted too much time looking into some of this stuff. But it appears, at least it appears, based on Internet searches, you know, that and five bucks, won't even give you, get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. But I think there's definitely some truth to it just because of the multitude of posts. But anyway, it appears that some of these guys are getting a, picking a little penny stock, which has no discernible pattern, and they're buying a bunch of it, and then they're giving it out to all their subscribers and the subscribers rush in and then they unload the stock it's the old pump and dump scheme there's nothing new on wall street and i think that's illegal i think it's called front running and i wonder why the sec hasn't caught up with them and that's probably because the sec is probably overloaded anyway their cocky nature about how they have the secret is probably what's aggravating me. Why do I have to struggle in the markets? As I often say, my friends who run hundreds of millions of dollars and and Greg used to run billions, not once have I seen any of these guys brag about what they do, but they've achieved more than... 99.9% .9 of everyone out there. Now, there is a paradox when it comes to trading. And we all know what a paradox is, but I found it interesting once I actually read the definition from my little Google dictionary that it's quite interesting, a seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement or proposition that when investigated or explained may prove to be well-founded or true. And I find that quite interesting. When you become a trader after a few years, you'll find out that there is a trader's paradox. The irony is that the more experience that you have, the more you realize how little control you have over the ultimate outcome. Now, it's true that you will be able to become better at your stock picking and picking the best markets and trading the best setups. 
But it's very humbling when you come to realize how little control you have. And I probably need to flesh this out further and how you have no control. Now, obviously, in any other profession that at least I can think of, it would be just the opposite. The more educated you become, the more experience you have, the more control you have of the situation. And I guess it's more of a realization in this business. And it's, again, it's quite humbling to realize that you cannot control what the markets do. This leads us to the Socratic paradox. Now, Socrates is attributed to saying, I know that I know nothing. And he said some other things that could you could say, well, he, he did say that or not, but we'll go ahead for purposes of this presentation and attribute it to him. Now, I find it interesting in G.C. G. C. Selden's book, The Psychology of the Stock Market, which I'd recommend you read. I, it's funny. I had a, I have a Kindle version. I read it. I had an online version. I have a Kindle version. And then not long ago when I'm moving, I found that I had one or two paper copies of the book. And there's a lot of information in there. And I was putting together a mind map, something that I haven't done in a while, but I found one of my old ones before I did this presentation today. And it looks like I pretty much copied nearly the entire book into the into the mind map. And there's a lot of good stuff in that little book. And it's like I said, you could it's in public domain because it's been out so long. So you can get it online. But you can also get a Kindle version cheap or just get a little paper copy of it. And I recommend you read it. It's on the books to read. And it always amazes me. It's like you go back to those books written 100 years ago, and there's a lot of good wisdom there. And in many cases, the wisdom is a lot better than what you're finding today. And it's also obviously very, very timeless in nature. So anyway, G.C. Selden said, the Socratic method applied to the average speculator would produce amusing results. Now, I've given presentations before where I said amazing results because I thought I wrote that down wrong. But I did a little research this morning, and it is amusing results. But by amusing, I'm assuming that he does mean amazing. And some of the older writings like this, they can be a little bit more flowery, if that's a word, in the way they write things and all. But I think that's what he's the point he's making. If you read a little further in the book, it, it'll make a little bit more sense. But the Socratic method, you're basically questioning things. And so instead of confidence, you have questions. And you're willing to realize that you don't have control of what the markets will do. You don't have control of this, of what is going to happen. Now, this is from a presentation I did a while back, and I could find when it was and possibly put the link in before I publish this. And I was thinking along the lines, kind of like I was thinking today, about what you think you know and what you actually know. And I didn't realize it, but after I drew my curve and started the presentation, there is actually a curve that looks something similar to the one on the top. And it's called the Dunning-Cougar effect. I'm just thinking of the Cougar effect. That sounds, that sounds like something interesting. <laughs> I do have a Cougar in this presentation. It's a tiger, but it could also be a Cougar. You'll see in one second. Anyway... It, it kind of dovetails in with this, what you think you know and what you actually know. And I think what you actually know is it's quite humbling. And I think that that's a whole purpose of this presentation. And once you reach that point, your life begins to get a lot easier. But it doesn't make the fact that it's very humbling 
any easier. So that part is still difficult. Now, as I often say, when you go from the analysis of the trade to the actual placing of the trade, you immediately stop step from the known into the unknown. Now, I've done complete presentations and multiple lessons on what I've dubbed the two U's, and that's borrowed from Dr. Brett Steenbarger, who talked a lot about that in some of his blogs. And his point is that when you're doing your analysis, you're using part of your brain. And just to oversimplify things, you're using that more analytical part of your brain. And once you get into the actual trade, you're using the more emotional part of that brain in trading from the gut i'm just thinking out loud here but curtis faith talks a lot about a, a whole brain approach using the left brain and the right brain once you're in the trade to be able to follow the plan and steenberger goes on to say that it, where the two u's come from it's like it's two different people two completely different people it's like the person who did the analysis and then the person who does the actual following of the plan. And I've, I think I've said this before, I've met people where, trading partners, where one person will do the analysis and put on the trade, and the other person will actually do the management and take off the trade. And it works for them. And I think we're all probably better analysts than we are traders. Now, once you enter your trade, you have to accept the fact that you have completely given up control. And that's hard, especially if you're very successful. As I often say, if you're an engineer and half your bridges fall down, well, let's just say one of your bridges falls down, you're probably not going to be an engineer very long. If you're a doctor, a surgeon, and you're killing off half your patients in low-risk surgeries, you're probably not gonna be a surgeon very long. But in trading, you're gonna be wrong a lot. In fact, I was getting into this in the Q&A that I did on 3.27.19. So the only thing that you control is you, and then you have to accept that fact. Once you're in a trade, you have, a, you have to accept the fact that you have completely given up control, and the only thing you can control is you. Now, your protective stop is set at a distance based on the statistics and not fear. And that's, that's one thing that I constantly have to wrap my head around. It's kind of like, how much? what's the most amount I want to lose in this trade? And then I want to stop to be really, really tight. Well, the reality is I'm going to have to loosen that stop up quite a bit to be within the statistics. And then I'm going to have to adjust my share size down accordingly to make sure that I'm within the normal volatility of the market. So your stop is going to be set on statistics and also obviously places where you will be wrong. Statistics kind of sums that up. Just pure statistics could be a little wide, but to make it easier to wrap your head around, around it, you have to be outside that normal volatility. And then you also have to have that stop at a place where you'll obviously be wrong. And the reason I'm going off on that pure statistic tangent is because if you're using pure statistics, then your stop's going to be so wide that it would be nearly impossible to trade. But to kind of simplify things, let's just say you have to be outside of normal volatility and at a place where you would obviously be wrong. And you can't have them placed on fear. So your protective stop set at a distance based on statistics and that fear will take you out if you are definitely wrong. Okay, where would you be wrong in the trade from a statistical standpoint and from a chart standpoint? But also keep you in as long as you are right. And I know there's an art and a science to this, 
setting of the stops and position management. I talk about it quite often. And that's the tough part. It's like, where would you be wrong? How much should you be willing to give up so you could ride out corrections along the way, but then have it close enough to where if a correction turns into something much bigger, it gets you out. But that comes back to acceptance. Once you actually place a trade, you have to accept what you have done. And be willing to give up control. Now, Roy Longstreet wrote a book called Viewpoints of a Commodity Trader. I didn't know it was a rare book. I gave it away thinking I could replace it. <laughs> but I did, so I'm going to have to give me a new copy. Anyway, it's a good little book. It's a quick little read. And it was written in the 70s. And he said the deepest secret for the trader is his ability to subordinate his own will to the will of the market. What I want the market to do and what the market is actually going to do are often two different things. Now, I've said this before, and one thing I was thinking about today, especially as I neared the deadline to go live here, is that there's a lot of different things that all kind of come together. There's fear, there's acceptance, there's control, and a host of other topics when it comes to trading psychology, behavioral economics, behavioral finance, and one of which is obviously fear. And there is a lot of fear, but that fear that we have to realize is actually inside of us and not in the markets in and of themselves. In other words, we're creating that own fear. I have a quote from Douglas here we'll get to in just one second, which will explain that a little bit more eloquently than what I just had. So there's no fear other than possibly FOMO, fear of missing out, when it comes to markets, as long as you're not an active participant. Now, dovetailing into prior presentations, I've done complete presentations just on fear, and a lot of that comes from Dr. Robert Morris' research, and I would recommend you read his books, Conquering Fear and The Kaizen Way, and these are all under books to read on my website, davelander.com slash books dash two dash read. And he talks a lot about fear and how really the fear is created within you, sort of like what Douglas says about it. And I came up with an example that, okay, well, I just happened to be looking at some commodity charts a while back. And I didn't realize, but there was a horrible bear market in cocoa in 2016, 2017. So how stressful was that bear market? Now, I know I've asked this question before. And I've never got I've never gotten the answer of, wow, I was really stressed out doing that bear market. Now maybe one day we'll find somebody who was long cocoa during this period. But to those who aren't familiar with commodity trading, this is a huge move. And when a commodity loses half of its value, that's a really, really big deal. Well, it didn't stress me out at all because I was neither long nor short this particular market, and probably neither were you. Cocoa is a tough market to trade, FYI. Not that there's any easy markets to trade. So the quote from Mark Douglas, the late great Mark Douglas, that I was alluding to is, what you fear is not the markets, but your inability to do what you need to do when you need to do it without hesitation. That's heavy. That's really heavy. And I think about this quote on a daily basis, usually multiple times when I'm like watching a position go against me and getting stressed out. Well, that stress can be defined as fear. And again, what you fear is not the markets, but rather your inability to do what you need to do when you need to do it without hesitation. Now, you can see him kind of going off on this fear tangent. And like I said earlier, once you kind of open up that Pandora's box, of trading psychology, it's like everything does sort of have a 
tangential relationship, I hope that's a word, <laughs> with everything else. And it's hard not to go off on too many different tangents. But fear is very important to embrace that fear and just realize, and I know easier said than done, the fear is within you and it's not coming from the market. Now, getting back to Mr. Longstreet, the harder we try, the poorer the results. It's only when we operate in a relaxed manner that we rise to do our best. And for me, I have to come back to this is what I've been doing for a long time. This is what works. Just follow it. Just do it. And it's tough. And that's one thing we were talking about in the Q&A on 327 is you really need to know the nuances. And you have to embrace and accept those nuances of your methodology. And without going into a lot of details, because I've done quite a few presentations on this before, but with swing to intermediate term trading, following Big Dave style, we're looking to get a short term piece out of the trade, a swing trade. But we know, and this could be boiled down to, to statistics, easy for me to say, but we know that just that short-term trade is not enough to make us successful longer term. This is why I'm a little adamant against some of these systems out there that are short-term only, and they don't allow for the occasional home run because they will eventually fail because you will have the occasional black swan even in something shorter term. And it's not my way or the highway, but I think by taking a hybrid approach where you're swing trading and making that small profit and taking profits off the table, you're able to hopefully ride out a longer term trend. And if you do it properly, and I know it's still your money, and it's a dangerous way to look at things. And if you read a lot of behavioral finance, they'll talk all about the fact that money is fungible meaning that a dollar is a dollar, it's not your dollar, it's not someone else's dollar, I should say. But psychologically for me, it is sort of the house's money. And if you can keep that mentality and ride off that trade for a long, long time, and as I said recently, all trades eventually end badly, but if you're willing to ride out that trade until it hits that stop, and if you have to emotionally monetize or mentally monetize or mentally account, whatever you want to call it, on that trade, then mentally account to where that protective stop is. And if you get stopped out, so be it. And at least you made so much money on that winning trade. So easier said than done. But if you could just follow the plan, just do it, then the better off you're going to do. And I think what Mr. Longstreet's alluding to here is the harder you try, the worse you're going to do. And one thing that I've been bringing back into my presentations lately is that I've got expenses coming out the wazoo lately because I sold the house and then we had to come up the price and then we had to give them some money to fix some things and so on and so forth. And there was a lot of moving expenses and now we're building the house and never built the house before. <laughs> I'll give you some advice on that. Don't. <laughs> anyway. So right now, I feel like, well, let me show myself how great I am by just going to Mr. Market and pulling that money out the market. Well, it's not that easy. And the irony is of trading it seems like right when you feel like you want that money, I need that money, I should say the most, is right when you go into a drawdown. That kind of led me to do the unhappy endings series that I recently did, the column and then the lessons in the learning management system on how all trades eventually and badly. And that circles back to the acceptance thing. You just have to accept that fact. Rotella wrote Elements of a Successful Trader, and he's now a very successful trader. And back then, from an interview that I saw with him, it seems like he was struggling at the time when he wrote the book. And that's why I think the psychology is so good in the book. The, the rest of the book, I'm sure it's okay. I didn't really remember getting anything earth shattering out of the rest of the book, but the psychology section was really good. And I would buy the book just for that. 
and you can find that under elements of successful traders. I'm sorry, under books to read. And he said, unsuccessful traders believe the market must act in the way they think. They are sorely mistaken. The better traders try to learn how the market thinks. And take it one step further, that's why I, it took me a long time, and that's why I eventually became a trend-following moron. I'm just going to follow along and let the chips fall where they may. I know. You just said the none. Lots of bat bombs along the way. Now, I found this picture. I backed up an old computer, which had a lot of my old presentations on, and also had some old photos, and I found this. Obviously, this must have been right after the hangover came out. The party we went to had some older farts at it, and nobody knew who I was. They're like, who are you, Mr. Daddy, Daddy, you know, Daddy Dave, Mr. Mom? I'm like, no, I'm Fat Jesus. <laughs> And I was worried everybody at the party would be dressed just like me because when my wife went to get a baby carrier from Goodwill, she ended up going all over town. And everywhere she went, she says, yeah, everybody's going as fat Jesus this year. Anyway, she went as a jungle cat. Now, the point I have here, I was thinking about jungle cats this morning. I realized I just saw this picture on my computer. I found this picture. It amazes me that people will have these exotic, dangerous pets like a jungle cat and then somehow expect that because it's their little pet that it's going to behave differently. And there's a lot of fables about that, like the scorpion and the frog and all that. Google that in your spare time. But just because you have a jungle cat and it's your jungle cat, you expect that jungle cat to behave differently and not to digress too far but we all seem to see these these ladies that marry these guys that are that are f-ups and they are thinking that or projects i should say and they think they're going to stop being an, an f-up <laughs> or no longer a project once they marry them but getting back to the markets if you have a tiger by the tail in other words, a very volatile stock, which Big Dave likes to trade. Ironically, one of the stocks I'm long is TIGR, Tigger. <laughs> so you can't get upset when it continues to behave like it has in the past. And that's the analysis thing. Like, oh, this stock looks great. It looks like it's getting ready to take off from this pullback or from this little IPO pattern or whatever. But what do you really study that chart, you'll notice that it does bounce around quite a bit. Even if it does have some structure to it, you can't expect it to behave differently. Now, one thing I'm realizing as I was putting together this presentation is I didn't give you a whole lot of solutions today. And usually I like to try to give you more solutions than I do problems. But the bottom line is if you can look at how the stock behaved prior to when you got into it, and then just accept the way it behaves after you get into it. And then also accept the fact that if you're wrong and your stop is placed properly outside of that normal volatility, then you're wrong. And if your stop isn't hit during the process and you've given it plenty of room, then let the chips fall where they may and then follow the plan. And I know it's cliche. It's a lot harder it's a lot easier said than done, but tra plan the trade and trade the plan. Also, garbage in, garbage out. Make sure you're using intuition on your trades and not intuition, as I often say, quite often, ad nauseum, in fact, from market wizards. So make sure you really think you have something good and not that you're using that intuition because you need to pay for your moving expenses, your new house, or whatever. So you got to be careful in that. Donald is in Tigger too. Congratulations, Donald. Well, at least I think so. <laughs> All right, any questions or thoughts on that? Uh, Donald says, would two to three ATRs be the right distance in most cases? Well, I, I kind of talked out of both sides of my mouth earlier because when I did the, wrote that quote probably a year or two ago, I didn't really think it through and just hearing it out loud made me realize that statistics is kind of a broad term 
or more of a metaphor I'm using there. When I say statistics, I'm using statistics, but I'm also saying where would you be wrong? And to calculate where you would you be wrong, you can use statistics, but you also have to look at the chart and use a little discretion, I guess, for lack of a better word. The ATR question, I get asked that a lot. I don't use ATR, but I think after you boil down all of my analysis on where would you be wrong, go through the money management module and the members. And I talk a lot about the art and science of protective stops and where would you be wrong and how I come to a stop. But the statistical part of coming to a stop is mostly eyeballing the chart. So if it's bouncing around two or three points a day and five or six points over a sharp period of time, I know that if my stop is somewhere within that, let's say if it's my stop's two or three points, noise alone is going to stop me out. I think in 1999 or 2000, I wrote an article called The the Myth of Tight Stops. Tight, you know, Use tight stops is universally preached. Well, that almost guarantees you're going to get stopped out. So to answer your question on ATR, by all means, if, if that helps you come to your analysis on where your stop would be outside of the normal noise of the market, then by all means. But my problem with statistics is that a statistically based stop, maybe because markets aren't normally distributed, I don't know why, but a pure statistically based stop is going to be so wide that I don't think you could ever be successful using it. Now, the question is, look at prior support resistance. Yeah. So you're answering your one step ahead of me. So look at like HV, which is statistical measurement. And if you've got a stock that has an HV of 100, that thing has been all over the place, even if you do have structure. So you just have to be warned that that stock is going to continue to behave like that jungle cat, right? It's going to eat you one day, right? So you have to make sure you're outside of that normal noise. And then there's a few other questions you need to ask yourself. Where's the support? Where's the resistance? Where would I obviously be wrong? So let's say you're trading an IPO and you're trading an IPO off a breakout to new highs. And then that IPO goes to new lows. Well, then you would obviously be wrong at new lows. Then that might be a little too far to place your stop. So maybe somewhere in between the breakout point and the low for the IPO, depending on how volatile the IPO is, might be a good spot. But always ask yourself, where would I be wrong? And that's the first thing to ask yourself in this particular trade. So let's say you have a stock, and all of this is covered under money management in a lot more detail and a lot more eloquently than I'm saying now. But let's say you have a stock that breaks out and has a pullback, and you're playing that first little breakout from that pullback. Let me just draw this in real quick. So let's say we have a stock. Let's say you have a stock that runs up, makes a base, and then breaks out, and then has a first little pullback. And this is just, I'll give you a couple more examples too, but this is just one example. Well, if you get long this stock, on this particular pattern, it comes all the way back in, you know you would definitely be wrong here, okay, because it's no longer a breakout. So now what you do is you think in worst, my father used to always say this, he taught me this, think in worst case scenarios and then improve upon that. And that's good advice for life in general, and that's what he was talking about, not the stock market. So worst case scenario if it comes all the way back, well, you're probably wrong if it comes all the way back to here, okay? On a similar vein, let's say you're trading, and I'll draw it like a cup and handle, but let's say it's a bow tie or a first thrust or something, transitional pattern, and you get long right here, okay? Well, if the market gets all the way back to new lows, well, then this big trend might still be intact. Remember, we're trading off a little trend here. So where would you be wrong if it went on new lows? You're wrong here, okay? So that's another way of looking at it for a transitional setup, for a breakout. The big mystery comes in as, and again, I'm kind of giving the whole presentation's lessons off, but do go in and watch those. 
But if you're trading a pullback and that pullback begins to fail, is this just a deeper correction here of this big fat uptrend or is this the start of something bigger? So this is where it gets a little bit trickier in the trading, but you still ask yourself, where would I obviously be wrong? Now, keep in mind, sooner or later, usually when I'm in person giving a presentation, I'll talk about probably when most of them are talking about discretion. But I'll say, hey, anybody in here get stopped out, out to the penny and then have the market reverse and leave them behind. And usually several people will raise their hand. It's like, yeah, we've all been there. So that's one of the things getting back to that acceptance thing is sooner or later you will get knocked out to a penny and the market will take off without you. And you just have to, getting back to the unknown thing and control, it happens. And I remember an example I used where we had a little solar stock. It took off. It was up about 50% or whatever before it went up like two or 300%. And the stop was at nine and it went down to 899. And, and there was only a few little, it was like 200 shares traded maximum at that level. And it never bid below nine or uh, um, let me think about that. It never asked below nine. I forget exactly what it was, but it was within a penny. And then somebody said, well, you had your stop at nine. Why didn't you put your stop going in at 8.99? It's like, well, if I could be that accurate, as I often say, you'd never see my fat ass again. But yeah, support resistance, sure. I mean, it should not come back. In this particular case, this would be support. So I really shouldn't come back in below that support level. Uh, it could be a little tricky in the IPOs because you don't have a whole lot of data, although I do love trading IPOs. But if it goes to new lows in an IPO, then I, absolutely you know you're wrong. So that's one thing you have to deal with. Okay? All right, any more comments or thoughts on that? I feel like today's one of those days where I throw some stuff out and then I go back in and rewatch and realize that, okay, we need to go back in and fix <laughs> fix this and make it a little bit more coherent. I think the problem is once I get into something like this, I start going off on all the different tangents and realize that how much really needs to be covered on the subject. Oh, look at that. See, I almost just dropped the F bomb looking at the ticker. <laughs> I was feeling like a genius this morning. What was a high on that? Wow. I got busy doing the weekend charts. Yeah, was it close to that IPT? No, I think I had to go another point or so. All right, uh, before I forget, something I want to cover real quick here. Kind of random thoughts on the subject. Everybody's going ape crap of this inverted yield curve. And that's another one of my what me worry things. It's funny. I was looking for my little David E. Newman <laughs> picture, and I found it, and I didn't realize it was on the Brexit thing whenever that first Brexit thing was, I wrote an article on that. I probably should dust it off now that Brexit's in the news again. So, or as I think they more accurately call it, F-E-U. Okay, so I had to stop myself from getting into a deep dive on inverted yield curves. I think you can end up in a lot of trouble doing that type of analysis, but from a quick little Googling, it looks like you get a recession somewhere between eight and 24 months, but that's not guaranteed. Now, whenever it comes to something interesting in markets, you have to ask yourself, is it just interesting or is it something that you need to know? And I, I think the yield curve thing is, it kind of falls under the interesting category, okay? It's certainly not a good thing, but I think it's hard to time market. So it's not something that you want to try to factor into your trading. And look at those numbers, 8 to 24 months, but not guaranteed. So can you time off of this? And the answer is no. And it reminds me of a lot of the intermarket technical analysis where you have really long lead and lag times. Do study intermarket technical analysis. Do know how markets are, in general, intertwined. 
But don't rush out and trade off of that because those relationships can often decouple, can often invert. The inverse ones could turn into together, if that's the right way of looking at it, and vice versa. And like the intermarket technical analysis, something like this with interest rates can have like a long lead lag time. So this could be signaling that we're going to have a recession two years from now. But we don't know. We'll know it when we see it. Now, another thing that as I'm going live, I'm thinking your representative sample is pretty darn small when it comes to this. So let's say you develop a system that trades every 10 years. Well, it could be wrong for 10, 20, 30 years and still statistically be correct if you have such a small sample. So I don't think we have enough history to make some sort of statement like this always happens or this will happen. And again, can you time off of it? If you can't time off of it, you need to toss it out. So that brings us to our next point. Even if it was guaranteed, how would you trade off that? There's a chance that eight months to two years from now, there will be a recession. So what do you do? Now, economists and economy is not an exact science. When you look at economy and the stock market, believe it or not, they're kind of decoupled. <laughs> No, Dave, the market does good in good, econo in good economies and bad in bad economies. Well, yeah, there's some truth to that. But again, it could be some long lead and lag cycles because the market could anticipate a bad economy and the economy could still be doing pretty good and the market continues to go up. The bottom line is it's the sentiment of the players. If everybody's feeling good about stocks, then the market goes up. If everybody's feeling bad about stocks, then the market goes down. An economist will tell you, what is it? How's it go? Economists tell you tomorrow why what they predicted yesterday did not come true today. Now, I was going to kind of rip economists a new one. <laughs> uh, but I guess if you think about traders in general, I guess our track records aren't that fantastic either. But to me, it just seems like price is always the final arbiter. And if you start looking at all this other stuff, you're going to end up with analysis paralysis. Yeah, don't completely ignore it, but don't get too excited. The other thing that I'm really thinking about here is because it's such, it's creating such a buzz and such excitement, it's almost like it's becoming fake news. So because everybody's so excited about it, like it's the end of the world, the world probably won't end, at least maybe not for a while. So don't get too caught up in the inverted yield curve thing. All right, any questions or thoughts? We'll go ahead and uh, I'll go get the live charts fired up here. In developing the learning management system while we're waiting on the data to come in, I reached a point where I wanted to help those who truly needed to be helped. And part of my come to Jesus, so to speak, <laughs> come to fat Jesus, <laughs> was, uh, I didn't have to put any fluffing in for that costume. But part of my come to Jesus was that my hands are really hurting bad carpal tunnel. And now even worse, I'm going to have to have some elbow surgery, which is not going to be pretty. And that's not the end of it yet. But anyway, that reminds me of how many people that I tried to help that didn't want to be helped because now what do you mean? Doesn't everybody want help? I don't know. That's freshman psychology rearing its ugly head, but spent 10 years with one individual. There's actually a few of those people answering questions. They never became successful. And finally, in, in one particular case, I'm like, go back and read the first book. I never bothered to read the first book. Well, you know, then, then you don't want to help yourself. Anyway, so I, this is where I, I'm going with this method, member's methodology, and these lessons are in small, easy-to-digest chunks, and some people said it's actually fun, which is kind of exciting. But anyway, I make sure I try to cover 
everything you need and anything that's not covered, I covered in the bi-weekly Q&A sessions. Uh, what else? Oh, also the progress is tracked. So let's say you're having trouble setting stops and I see that you haven't finished the money management module then I know that we probably should focus on that. All right, I'm not gonna walk you through the rest of that. I've done that before, there's a lot there. But instead, let me do this. Let me get my chart set up. And then let's take a look at this market. If you guys wanna start asking about individual stocks now, feel free to do so. Okay. Let's take a look at the P's and then let's take a look at a few sectors in here. The one thing that I'm noticing with the P's is that if we were to go back in time a little bit and let's see if we could find what I was looking at somewhere around 25th or so. And if you go back around a month or so, you can see that we're relatively unchanged, okay? It depends on what time of day you're looking. But that fact tells me that the market has lost a little bit of steam. It's not rocket science, okay? I'm just looking at the net-net price change. Obviously, from the December lows to recently was a pretty good run, but... The market is a bit of what have you done for me lately now as it would say quite a bit the market still if you take a look at like a weekly chart has a big picture retrace look to it now what does linda rasky say the market will always do the or not always but will often do the most obvious thing in the most unobvious manner and the corollary to that which she also said was the Market will do what it has to do to frustrate the most. Now, to me, it looked like this whole thing was a big picture retrace, but what did the market do? Well, the market shot up a little higher, making it look like it was not going to roll back over. It was going to go back to old highs, okay? So let me rephrase that. The market shot higher above the recent little peaks in here, and it sure looked like it wanted to go back to old highs, and then what happens? Well, then it rolled back over. So it'll do the obvious in an unobvious manner, and it'll do what it has to do to frustrate the most. Now, as a general statement, I still think we're okay in here. We'll have to give the market, market the benefit of the doubt. In the back of my head, though, I still see this big picture retrace pattern. Now, so how do I play that? because it sounds like I'm talking on both sides of my mouth. Well, what I've done is I have taken things as I normally do in a setup by setup basis. And if I see a setup I like, I take it, okay? Because the market in general is doing okay. Now, I'm not rushing out and doing any kind of asset allocation or something based on this. But I'm like, well, market's sort of hanging in there. I see a setup I like, so I'm going to take it. NASDAQ Composite had a little bit deeper retrace in the piece. And let's take a look at this. So it shot down and it shot back up. And then, like I said earlier, it did the unobvious thing of taking off before turning back down. So it's not the end of the world. And a few big up days would put us back to these recent highs in here. But like the P's, you still have to get there to negate that. Now, not that we could trade off of this, but one thing that would kind of dovetail in with the big picture retrace argument is that the man on the street is doing two things. One, he's regretting that he sold out in December. And like the guy that rented me my moving truck said, He's re he regretted that he didn't buy more in December. He's, he's glad he held on, but regretted he didn't buy more. So the people who got nervous back in December and feel like they dodged a bullet, I think if this thing begins to roll over in earnest, I think they're going to all run for the door at the same time. Well, just look at the charts, and the charts are telling you that too. 
Donald, you're all over my Landry list. I guess we could look at some of those. <laughs> Usually I don't discuss stocks on our Landry list, but we're definitely on the same page. So congratulations. He's asking about, looks like my entire Landry list. You're not going off the Landry list, are you? Those are all your picks? Okay, so Russell 2000, here is the rub. You could argue that the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ maybe have beat that retrace and now just kind of pull them back a little bit. But it's kind of hard to make that argument so far, at least, in a Russell 2000 because it stalled out and has sold out in earnest. Sold off in earnest, okay? So you got the thrust pullback and then so far the thrust lower. Now where I'm going with this, if we take the chart out, and let's go back to a weekly. When in doubt, take the chart out. So you got a thrust, a pullback, and then now we've got this slide. Now we're not this far in this yet, but this is this should probably be a question mark down here. Like, are we gonna head even further lower? But it's a pretty serious sell-off, as you can see. Oh, it's further than I thought it was. Okay, let's do this. Let's go back to the weekly. Uh, let's take the chart out. F1 and 5. Yeah, it's still pretty serious. So you can see that it did peep up to make it look like it was more than a retrace. In other words, a bona fide reversal. And so far, it's begun to sell off again. Now, what am I hoping? I'm hoping this goes on to make new highs. I'm hoping the market just goes up forever. Much easier to be long than it is to be short, but I have to take what the market gives. I also like bull markets better because it's easy for me to work with clients in bull markets, and that rising tide tends to lift all boats. Most people don't short, and it's hard to explain to them why they should short, which isn't always the reason you think. It's not just because you can make money when the market goes down, because it's not easy, believe me, but it, it really helps you to see both sides of the market and stops you from being a perma bull. So I think the jury is still out on the Russell 2000. You know what I haven't done lately with this guy? Let's take a look at the bow ties. So it looks like the bow tie moving average is on the cusp of rolling back over. That would not be a major signal because we're not coming off of all-time highs. The last time it did it off of all-time highs back here was a major signal. And let me just, I was it on this day here? I don't remember what day it triggered, but let's see. 25% drop. That's pretty serious. Media considers a bear market at what? 20%. And it might have triggered here. So let's take this reading here and see. Yeah, it's still 25%. Close enough to more. Okay. All right. So Donald's not on my Landry list. He's just finding the same stock as me. All right. That's fine. Usually I won't discuss them, but since I don't have any official recommendations coming off of it today, We'll take a look at some of those. Now, as you go through the sectors, a lot of them are acting like the overall market. Energies, for instance, look a heck of a lot the, like the S&P 500. Big picture retrace, tried to break out, came back in. And you can go through these at your leisure and see that what I'm saying is happening over and over. One thing I find interesting is the foods are trying to break out in here. And foods, as you know, are a defensive issue. So is that a clue? It could be. It could be. Now, we can't trade off of that. It's, again, if you've got a clue, can you trade off of it? No, but put your little scenario together. And then again, price, as usual, becomes the final arbiter. What has me concerned is two things or two sectors. One, the XLF. And let's just throw the bow ties in here, which I haven't done lately. Not a huge signal, but close enough. You can see that the 10 is less than the 20, and the 20 is less than the 30. That in and of itself, as I showed last week and many other weeks prior, can be a pretty good signal to help to keep you on the right side of the market. Ideally, you want to be long markets where those moving averages are in proper order. In other words, for uptrends, the 10 simple is greater than 20 exponential, 20 exponential is greater than 30 exponential. And you want to be generally short markets are out of them when the 30 is below the 20 and the 20 is below the 10. In other words, they're in downtrend proper order. I think I messed up the downtrend proper order. The 10 is below the 20 and the 20 is below the 30. Okay. 
And right now the 10 has flipped back over to 10 below the 20 below the 30. Now, let's take a look at the banks. That's the other thing that has me concerned. The shorter term moving averages, or at least the daily moving averages off of the recent little peak in here have turned back down. Not the end of the world, but they're looking pretty ugly. How's that for an oxymoron from a trend following moron? <laughs> And as you can see, thrust down, followed by a little bit of a, a pullback. Now, it's not off of all-time highs, but it is off of multi-month highs, so it's a little bit concerning. I don't trade these bow ties and first thrusts off of multi-month highs, but it pays to pay attention. I'd rather, I'd rather trade them off of lows. All these, uh, all these hoes. And Facebook, how do I get rid of that? I guess I got to stop befriending them. I mean, I'll, uh, I got tons of hoes asking me to be friends with them. They don't, they don't look like hoes anymore. They look kind of like average, and I think they're doing that on purpose. Anyway, so banks and financials are looking pretty questionable. And I don't know if that's an R, uh, what is it, Harbinger? of things to come, but it's certainly something that we might want to pay attention to. The other thing I find a little interesting is you got areas like the drugs tried to break out, but then came back in. Let's take a look at a weekly there. This is something I often talk about that is concerning when you have a V-shaped recovery at a high level. And my point here, and let me clean this chart up and maybe get a better pen. My point here and my concern is that when you're at high, high levels, like all-time highs, like the banks, keep the stock picks coming. We're going to get through them all. We'll have time. In fact, we're getting ready to jump into that. When you have something like the banks that have made all-time highs, I'm sorry, drugs, sold off hard, this is a weekly chart, and come all the way back to make new highs, this is what I call a V-shaped recovery at high levels. High levels is all-time highs, so this is high levels. High levels, okay, and then you come all the way back up. Well, that kind of looks like a double top. Well, it can be, right? But by the time the market's all the way back here from way down here, it's very overbought, and it's hard to mount a new leg on the old one. So that's one pattern that I'm not very keen on trading on the long side just because it's a little dangerous to jump into a market after it's made a leg higher into brand new lit in brand new highs okay hard to run a race after you have ran a race by the way linda has a new book yes i helped linda proof the book so i know all about it she mentions trading sardines in it she does yeah <laughs> yeah in fact i tried to get her the domain because i i have sardine trader i thought i had trading sardines and come to find out i do not so um, I, that was my mistake when, when I told her, hey, I'll just give you the domain. So she was also interviewed in Stocks and Commodities recently. Oh, cool. Yeah, I need to get in touch with those people again. They actually kind of launched my career uh, in 1995, and I've had an interview or two with them since. All right, individual stocks. GH is on the lander list, but I think it's okay to cover since it's not an official recommendation. And... I'm not going to suggest you go after it. This was one that I covered in the Q&A yesterday or day before. or No, no, no. I'm sorry. I covered this in my now column on my website. So if you go to my now column, I talked about this one. And the frustration here was that I think we were long the service, too. We got long. We got a swing trade out. I got stopped out down here. And then, of course, it took off without me. Um. I think you have a good eye, Donald. Unfortunately, I just think it's it's gotten a little too crazy. Your HV is 90, okay? And it's just, it's a nice little deep retrace. I think it could go on to make new highs. I think it's a good looking setup. I would use a very liberal entry and a very liberal stop. And by the time you do all that, you're not gonna get enough shares on to make it all worthwhile. So I would pass, but yeah, I hear you. It has pretty much all the good make, makings for a good stock. You know, I'm, I'm kicking myself in the butt, but I'm also realizing that I followed my rules. I liked it when it broke out here in this pullback, but I wanted to see a little bit deeper.
pullback. Now, maybe I was too much of a perfectionist. I don't know when it comes to this one. So, yeah, good eye, but leave it alone. OSW is another one which I've been looking at. It's an IPO, and let's take a look at the, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. So technically, you would have been long yesterday on the buy at B, and let's take a, let's put a moving average in here, and let's go with a five-day moving average, and I'll tell you why in just one second. I have a little system, which I haven't really named, but it's on, it's actually, you can actually probably find it on my website. I know it's in the members area. No, nope. where's my moving average? Did it work? It's there. Oh, it didn't come out. Okay, so I guess it's not until the end of day six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, so it's it doesn't plot. Why is it not plotting? Anyway, it you would it would be long based on that because you would have to have the low grade of the moving average. One, two, three, four, five. So I don't know why it's not plotting. But yeah, it would look okay. I mean, any close up here, any close above yesterday's close, I think would trigger a signal or would be a signal on that one. Solly's another one I've been watching. I sort of kicked myself in the butt on that one too, but it didn't fully, there's my moving average. It didn't fully fit my, a couple of things. The range was a little small. The volume was a little light. But, yeah, I think it looks okay uh, in here, but it's super duper 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 thin. So I think it's too thin to go after, but I hear you. I guess I should buy it and introduce it to everyone in the world, right? A little pump and dump, huh? Sarcasm implied. Sarcasm is my second favorite asm. Anybody knows what my first favorite asm is? Sarcasm. Oh, no. Although I, I have to admit, that's a good one. Now, enthusiasm. Smart looks okay. Let's back the chart out a little bit. It, it looks a little extended to me, but it looks okay. I guess if the market wasn't as questionable, maybe, even though it is fairly speculative, it's had a pretty good run. I'm just having a hard time getting excited about it, but you could certainly do much worse. That looks pretty good. Donald, you're all over my list, buddy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is an interesting looking one, too. And it's also on my list. Metals and mining hasn't been doing that great. Anybody know exactly what these people do? But, yeah, you've got kind of a cup and handle type of situation working here. Volatility, a little bit on the crazy side, but not too bad. But, yeah, you could certainly do much worse than that. I've kind of pulled in my horns a little bit and gotten really selective lately. MGTX. Yeah, this is another one that I wrote down yesterday. You sure you're not on a service, Donald? <laughs> um, I can pick it apart a little bit in here. These wide range bars and kind of all over the place a little bit. And it also had a pretty good run, 100% over a, a short period of time, wide and loose longer term. But you could certainly do a lot worse. So, yeah, it's not, not a bad-looking stock. VCYT. Oops. CYT. Yeah, put this on your momentum list. The pullback is not deep enough. I mean, the other problem, too, it's ran, what, 400% over a short period of time. If you're long, it would be great to be long with a big old fat wide stop. Maybe on a little bit deeper pullback, but right now it's not ready. Put it on your momentum list. Not on service. Just taught me when I, well, I did too good of a job, huh? <laughs> what? Who asked for that one? That's a piece of crap. <laughs> Obviously, I didn't, I didn't teach Howard well. What do you want to do with that? You want to buy it? It's down 50% uh, today. Seriously? It trades like 10 shares a day. It's down 50% today. Yeah, you should, you should buy it. Experience is the best teacher. <laughs> Mortgage your house.
put it all in there. Rap Technologies is one that I liked. My my only thing I couldn't wrap my head around is that it's kind of a one-dimensional company. But Dave, you shouldn't care. Well, I know. They have a little gun that shoots this string out that wraps around you if you're a bad guy running away from the cops or running towards the cops, depending on which you're doing. Um, and I just felt like it just was such a single dimensional company in that it just didn't seem all that proprietary to me. Now, sometimes I get my trouble, I get in trouble with these kind of things, but mostly that line of reasoning is when I'm looking at a pioneer setup. So I was looking to buy this one on a new closing high and then I passed based on that. Okay. So, yeah, you had a secondary setup recently that wasn't too bad. I didn't like the way it pulled all the way back to where it broke out that much, but it looked okay, and I decided to pass. I mean, you have to decide whether you're going to go with the position or not, but more importantly, you have to be willing to, as they say in Frozen, let it go. If you don't take the setup, you can't agonize over the fact that you didn't take the setup when it doubles. The problem with that is we tend to notice when stocks double, but we don't notice how many times you don't take a setup and they end up having in value. But yeah, it looked okay this recent little pullback. Maybe if it breaks out on the next pullback, it could be possible. So yeah, put that on your momentum list. I'm pretty sure it's on my momentum list, CPG. The first thing I'm seeing here is that it pulled back in it just got barely above this little peak in here to pull back in. Uh, does it look like a major bottom? Yes. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. Let's take a look at the weekly. Okay, not much to glean from the weekly. It just kind of looks like a like a pullback on a weekly, but that's okay. Um, with the transitional pattern, often transitional pattern on the daily, that is, the weekly still will be in a serious downtrend. Um, yeah, put it on your list, but it's not ready yet. In this particular case, this thing would now have to break out above its recent highs in here and then maybe look to play a pullback from that, okay? Or ideally go down bottom out and make the mother ball bow ties six months from now and make it more of like a Phoenix type of strategy. CBERS. Okay, well, longer term, the stock is all over the place. So that would be a big red flag for me. Now, keep in mind that stock's personality can change. But in general, you have to respect that. Now, looking on a micro level, volume is okay, even given the low price. But it kind of shot up with a few wide range bars and came all the way back in. I would pass on that one and pick it apart. You know, I'm picking it apart because of the longer term wide and loose action. NVTA, good, uh, good picks today, by the way, in general, except for that, that one, MYT, did I pull the correct symbol? Yeah, that's why I was ribbing you, because I'm sure you gave me the wrong ticker on that one. And if you didn't, then I'm gonna kick you out. Let's find out, MYT, you said it was MYT, right? MYT? Uh, Okay, are you sure that's, is that it? I'm gonna kick him out. I'm kicking Howard out. Let's see, how do I do this? Let's see. Uh, how do I kick him out? Let's kick him out. Let's kick him out for not being a trend follower. No, I don't wanna make a presenter. Goodbye, Howard. Okay, Howard is gone. <laughs> All right, that's what I'm going to start doing. Yeah, all right, see you, Howard. I'm going to kick you out if you ask for something, if you ask about something that you shouldn't be asking about. Maybe he made a mistake on the symbol. <laughs> That'll be fun. All right, NBTA, very good, Donald. You're not going to get kicked out for this one. Don't worry about that. You know, longer term, all over the place, over the short to the medium term, looking pretty good. It's got its act together. I think it's okay. I'd like a tiny bit more pullback, but I hear you on that one. 
Okay, it's not bad. So yeah, that should definitely go on the watch list. So my NYT chart looks different than your NYT looks different than mine. NYT, yeah, poor Howard. We pick it on him today. That's what I have. NYT. What's NYT supposed to be? You think that TC's screwed up or something? Looking okay. All right, poor Howard. <laughs> Maybe we kicked him out of this there. All right, any more? Going once, going twice. Well, as usual, and thank you everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Any unanswered questions? Are you, I would say email me, but sh uh, go through the learning management system now because with Carpal Tunnel, it's been really hard to answer emails. So anyway, uh, and other reasons too, one-on-one -on -one is simply not working, but we can get into that at some other point. If we don't talk to you now and then, everybody have a great weekend. And then I guess uh, I'll see all you guys and girls again next Thursday. Thank you so much.